All right, everybody, let's get into feature selection. So what we're presenting here for feature selection is really a set of methodologies for feature ranking. We're trying to determine which features are most important, which features are less important, maybe which features can we remove in order to build a good model. Now, there are often many predictor features or input variables available for us to work with in a subsurface problem. There's good reason to be selective, as mentioned in the last lecture. Throwing in every possible feature is typically not a good idea. And generally, in general, it's best that we have a careful selection of the fewest features that provide the most amount of information. This typically results in the best models, the most interpretable models, the models that are least likely to be overfit, the models that are most reliable for us. So, more motivation to work with fewer features. More features result in more complicated workflows. In fact, that's an interesting problem. If you're working with more and more features, there's more chance that you've made a mistake along the path. More complicated workflows, more chance for blunders. Higher dimensional features are so much more difficult to visualize and understand what's going on. You may miss important information. More complicated models may be more difficult to interrogate, interpret to QC. Given the value of decisions that we make in the subsurface, we need to be able to understand the model. We can't treat it like a black box. Inclusion of highly redundant or collinear or multicollinear variables or features increases model instability and it decreases the prediction accuracy. That directly impacts what we'll call later on model variance, and the result is we get poor performance when it comes to true testing of the model. More features or variables increase computational time. It's more difficult to work with the model. It takes longer to run. And of course, the risk of overfit goes up as we have more features. Feature ranking is really just a set of metrics or methodologies to try to assign relative importance to each of the features. With respect to the information they contain for inference or specifically for the prediction of a response or multiple responses. There's a wide variety of different possible methods to perform this and I recommend a wide array approach. Understand each one of the methods and use a variety of the methods, compare and contrast them with each other to try to distill what's going on with your features. So the general types of feature ranking break up into these groups. Visual inspection of the data distribution scatter plots, statistical summaries, model-based, and recursive feature elimination are four different categories that we're going to cover. <clears throat> now, while we're going forward, I feel like I need to put this caveat up right in advance and just set this straight. Expert knowledge. We should not neglect expert knowledge. In fact, if you run a statistical analysis and it says, and depth doesn't matter for porosity, but you know from your expert knowledge that there in fact are compaction trends within that area, maybe the problem is you've sparse data and you're not able to see that pattern. We should always use expert knowledge when selecting the features to work with. We should use our knowledge of the geoscience and the engineering context to ensure that we're not throwing away valuable information. Maybe for this limited sample set, but going forward, you wouldn't want a model that actually neglects essential features that explain the physical phenomenon that we're trying to understand. Well, this should also be a learning opportunity. We are learning while modeling. We are learning while doing feature ranking. We're testing new hypotheses. Maybe based on expert knowledge, we have a hypothesis. This matters. This will be impactful. We're testing that in a data-driven manner. So let's talk about the first metric, and that would be visual inspection. Anytime you have a multivariate setting, a bunch of different features to work with, Let's start with univariate analysis and statistics. Look at one variable at a time. Summary statistics, look and see what's going on. Are there any data issues? Maybe we don't trust that feature because there's something unreliable just in its summary statistics in a univariate sense. Do we trust all the features equally or some more reliable measures? We may be able to dis discern that by performing this very simple visual inspection and looking at distribution summary statistics. 
Are there issues that need to be taken care of? Maybe there's more data prep that should happen in advance. If you have outliers, and then we go through the rest of the analysis, those outliers may have been impactful. And so we want to start with basic, basic visualization and check for these issues. So summary statistics, simple as can be. We've covered already concepts of statistics. We've talked about the idea of you know, measures of central tendency, measures of dispersion, min, max, percentiles. And so there are simple commands in Python by which we can take all of our features, immediately get summary statistics like counts, means, standard deviations, min, the quartiles, or any percentile, and so forth. We should also look and see if we have non-valid um, values like NANs, not in numbers, missing values within our data set. That might tell us that we have poor data coverage for some of our features, which may influence our choice. If we have a feature that offers some ability to predict, but it's only available on 20% of the data, we may not find that a reasonable feature to work with, or we're going to have to do something more in data imputation, replacing the missing values with their uncertainty. Okay, you look at general behavior, central tendency, mean, dispersion, variance, issues of negative values, or non-physical values, values outside of a natural, plausible range of possible outcomes. Univariate distributions are important too, not just the summary statistics. We want to see what the distributions are doing. <clears throat> we may find that there are distributions that are have issues with them. There's gaps in the range of values that are sampled. Maybe there's spikes. We have a situation where we have a lot of values that seem to be the same, may indicate a problem with the data set. We may see distribution shapes that do not make sense relative to our knowledge about the natural phenomenon. We may also want to look at the distributions and figure out, would it be fair to use them for specific metrics or methodologies that require a certain distribution type or shape? And so we may want to check that. We may also recognize we need to do some type of data prep, distribution transformations, cleanup. Maybe we have a bias issue. and We talked about that already. Distributions may be biased. Universe varied distributions. So we take our data set and we look at each one of them. We plot their histograms. We've already talked about histograms, very straightforward. We can identify if we have a single mode. Is this another mode or is it just noise within the data? We can look at whether or not we have skew or symmetric distributions. We can look to see if we have potential outliers or values. We can also look at the general level of kurtosis or peakedness of the distributions. Do we have something that's more flat fat tails or something that's more peaked as we see right here. Well, so we can look through them and determine whether or not they have specific distribution shapes like Gaussian and so forth. We can also, if we needed to, we could perform statistical tests to compare them to parametric fit Gaussian distributions to see if they do have, in fact have a Gaussian shape. Bivariate statistics. Well, once we've done univariate, it makes sense to jump up to bivariate statistics and see what the general shape or behavior of the distributions are. You can spot basic collinearity. Multicollinearity would be hard to see because that could be a combination of multiple features to predict another. You wouldn't see it in bivariate plots necessarily. But simple collinearity where you have two features that are closely related to each other, that'll show up. You can also see if the distributions are bivariate Gaussian. That is, they have that typical ellipsoidal shape, homoscedastic invariance, and linear conditional expectation. In other words, linear relationships in the bivariate. So we can go ahead and look at all of our features right here. The bivariate distributions are shown in a matrix scatter plot. Once again, in Python, this is just one line of code. I think this methodology right here is probably from Seaborn, but there's many of the common statistical tag packages include really good methodologies for doing these bivariate plots. So are there variables that are closely related to each other? Well, we don't see any lines on the plot. That's a good sign. We don't see variables that are perfectly related with each other. We see perhaps porosity permeability as expected has a very high correlation coefficient, probably around 0.8 with linear relationship. That's not uncommon. We see some nonlinear relationships. That's something to pay note of. We see something really interesting going on right here between production and brittleness. There seems to be a sweet spot 
So there's some interesting constraints. Heteroscedasticity is all over the place. This is not a simple multi-Gaussian situation. We can also, so we can see that from the bivariate statistics, the general relationships, that we have some strong linear relationships between a couple of the features, but I don't suspect anything as far as a strong degree of collinearity between any of our features. So we wouldn't want to necessarily throw something out immediately. We can also look at bivariate statistical descriptions. Covariance is a very useful one. Covariance we've talked about already. Aha, uh -huh. that's the reason we covered those prerequisites. We need to, um, covariance talks about how two features vary with regard to each other, with respect to each other. And so we want to look at whether or not we have strong degrees of relationships or linear relationships between any one of our features. And specifically here we'll be concerned with how our features relate directly to the prediction of a response feature. We're thinking predictively now. If we're moving beyond inference to making predictions, we're trying to actually get a function that will describe or transfer us from the inputs, the predictor features, to the response, the output, the response feature or features. Covariance is a useful way to do that. We can look for the relationship and covariance between each of the predictor features and the output response feature. We can, now, the problem we have with covariance is covariance is sensitive to the actual variance. That is kind of somewhat arbitrary, because if you think about it, when we were doing data preparation, we made a choice of how to represent the data. Now, let's take a very simple example. If you had permeability, you can represent it as a Darcy or a millidarcy. Now, when you go from Darcy to millidarcy, you're effectively multiplying each one of the values by 1,000 which makes sense. But if you look at the fundamental expectation and how it is influenced by scalars applied to random variables for variance, you'll find that it has this relationship right here. The variance of a scalar or constant multiplied by a random variable x is equal to the square of that constant times the original variance of x, which means when we go ahead and multiply by a thousand, we would actually increase the variance by an order of 1 million. Or if you go from percentage to fraction, like in the case of porosity, which be a multiplication or division by 100, you're changing by 10,000, the variance. So I hope you can see that variance is somewhat, it, the actual magnitude of variance can be a little bit arbitrary based on the units we choose. And so co covariance can be an issue because it's sensitive to the variance. So we could use the correlation coefficient. Correlation coefficient, as we saw before, is a standardized version of the covariance. And because of that, it's not going to be sensitive to the actual dispersion or variance of the data set. So we could get the same results for if we're working with porosities um, that are fractional versus percent representation of porosity. So the correlation coefficient, once again, it's going to be limited to measuring the linear relationships between two variables. It removes the sensitivity of dispersion or variance by normalizing by the product of the standard deviation of each one of the features. It's a, it's a nice little normalization, forces it to be bounded between negative 1 and 1, which is really cool for interpretability. Now, we talked about the rank correlation coefficient. It's good we covered all this. I won't show the equations right now, but you can go back to the previous lecture where we where we talked about multivariate analysis. And so the rank correlation coefficient applies a rank transform to all of the data first. What that does is it makes it so it's more robust when you have nonlinear types of relationships going on. In fact, it becomes a measure of the monotonic relationship, how the two variables are increasing or decreasing together. It relaxes the linear assumption. In addition, it does help out with outliers, as we saw previously when we were working with a comparison between the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient and the Spearman rank correlation coefficient. So in general, we could use the rank correlation coefficient to look at the relationship between each of the predictor features and the response feature to see the strength of the monotonic relationship. That's pretty useful stuff too. We also covered partial correlation coefficients and that's beautiful. That's actually really cool. 
because what we can do with partial correlation coefficients is we can remove or control for all of the other features so we can look at the relationship between one predictor feature and the response feature while removing in a linear sense the relationships from all of the other predictor features. So we're isolating once again in a linear manner the relationship. And so that's pretty powerful stuff. We've gone through the workflow and methodology to do that. So we've covered partial correlation coefficients. So we can use it so we can compare each one of the features, predictor features, to the response feature while controlling for the other variables. Now, of course, there's assumptions there. And the assumption is that we're only looking at linear relationships between all of the variables. No significant outliers because that can have a huge impact on the linear regression that's required as a step within the calculation. And approximately bivariate normality, bivariate Gaussian distributions between all of the variables. That's why we did the matrix scatter plot to check to see if we have something kind of reasonable around that. Yeah, so it's pretty, it, we're in pretty good shape. We don't have really strong departures. I, I admittedly, I know it's not perfect, but it's not, it's not too bad. I think we'll be pretty good. All right, we could, we'll also apply the Gaussian transformation. In, in a univariate sense to try to improve or clean up. So if we go ahead, we talked about each one of these metrics, we applied each one of them to all of our predictor features, porosity, permeability, acoustic impedance, brittleness, TOC, total organic carbon, the vitronite reflectance, a measure of maturity of the rock. And we, we calculate covariance, the correlation coefficient, the rank correlation coefficient, and partial correlation coefficient. We also plotted the zero with a red line. And so for each one of these measures, the closer you are to zero, the less meaningful or the weaker the relationship individually for each one of these predictor features to the response, which in this case is a fluid production rate from the subsurface. So this is kind of cool. We can look across and we can see the covariance is saying that the porosity and the permeability are important. And the other features are not as important. They're closer to being zero. Now, if you go to the correlation coefficient, what you can see immediately is that permeability, in fact, was being demoted with covariance probably because the measure of dispersion was small. It didn't seem to be as important. Now, if you look at the TOC, what you can see with it is, in fact, that it was also being demoted probably because it had a small degree of dispersion. But when we control for that, standardized with the correlation coefficient, it looks more important. Now, if you compare between correlation coefficient and the rank correlation coefficient, they're actually very similar. And this is a very good check. It's telling us that we don't have major issues with outliers in a bivariate sense, and that we don't have major issues with kind of deviations from linear messing up the relationships with the correlation coefficient. There, there is a the relationships are, in general, linear as opposed to being more curvilinear and monotonically increasing and decreasing. Now, if we look at the partial correlation coefficient, there's a very interesting story being told here. The first story is porosity and permeability are not as important as they were before with the rank and the correlation coefficient. That's suggesting, and, and we know this from looking at the data, porosity and permeability are sharing quite a bit of information. They have a high degree of linear correlation with each other. And so they both get demoted because individually they look weaker when you account for or control for the relationship of all of the other features. In other words, the relationship that they're closely correlated with. Porosity, you remove the influence of permeability, it's weaker. The other thing that's interesting is that we'll see that TOC has actually switched its sign. It had a positive rank and correlation coefficient, but now it has a negative partial correlation coefficient. When we control for all the other features, it actually has a weaker relationship and it reverses. That, now that, that is fascinating. Okay, so we can go through and look at our features and now we're getting, we're kind of refining in and identifying that yes, porosity and permeability clear, clearly are important, but we can now say, well, acoustic impedance probably holds some importance we may still retain TOC, and we're probably still interested in vitronite reflectance as kind of one of the, kind of near the end. All right. 
conditional statistics. Now, we've already covered this before in the fundamental statistics and probability sections, but we may be interested to know the relationships as far as how do the distributions change over different ranges of the response feature. Now, that's really fascinating. So, here's a point. I could calculate the conditional distribution of the predictor feature, conditional to a low and high case of the response feature, and I can compare them. And if they're very similar to each other, this is telling me that my predictor feature doesn't behave any differently for high or low values of the response. It probably doesn't have much of a relationship with it. It may even get to the point where they're independent of each other, in fact. And so this is giving us a measure of how much information is available. So what I've done is I took production. I binned it high and low production. Just looking at the distribution production, trying to make a pretty good separation of what would be a low and high producing well. And then I produce a violin plot. Now you can do this for a box plot, but I like the violin plots. They're really groovy looking. I think they're super cool. I, I have an example in this of a workflow that we'll cover for doing this. I think these plots are just really cool. And so what we have is production low in green, production high in orange, porosity. And so this is the standardized predictor feature. Now we standardize it, we transformed it to have a mean of zero and a variance of one. And we did that specifically so that we can make these comparisons across all of our predictor features and the plots are all falling in the same relative location. And so what we're going to key into is how much this distribution changes. If we have a case like vitronite reflectance, what's happening here is that we have a bit of a slight shift of lower vitronate reflectance for low production and higher for high production. But besides that, there's not that much change. Now, if you go back here to brittleness, it's the same story. They're, they're very similar to each other. But if you go to TOC or porosity and permeability, you see a very significant offset between the two. It's telling us that there's quite a bit of information in understanding porosity in order to make a prediction of what's going on with regard to production. Next, we can also look at another concept that's really interesting, and that is called mutual information. Now, with the previous plot and using conditional statistics, we're trying to get away from this idea of being constrained by a model. We're trying to be model free. We don't want to have to assume linearity or multi or bivariate Gaussianity or whatever it might be, like we did with partial correlation coefficients. With the previous plot, we just did conditional statistics and we just compared them. No model. Mutual information is an extension or, or even a greater generalization of trying to understand the relationship between two variables without any type of model whatsoever. If you go back to the fundamental concept of independence, it says that the joint probability between x and y is equal to the product of the marginal probability of x and the probability of y. That holds up if they're independent of each other. Now, if we're going to look at a relationship between feature y and feature x, where feature x could be a predictor feature and feature y could be the response feature, we could go ahead and bin that. If we bin, we get a marginal here, a marginal here, marginal probability, marginal probability, and we get a joint probability here. We can calculate that, and what we'd get is we'd get the marginal for y and the marginal of x. Now, we would expect, given independence, that we would see this joint would be equal to this product right here, just the product of the two marginals. But in fact, we measure that joint directly from the data set, and so we can put it here in the numerator. So this ratio right here, if we get a 1 for that ratio, that would indicate that we have independence. And if you take a log of 1, you're going to get 0. So if you do this summation over all of the possible bins, we bin up and put a mesh down here and get all the possible bins, and we sum over all the bins in x, all the bins in y, all the bins are summed, and we calculate this log every time we have independence indicated by the, the marginal product being equal to the joint, then we will get a zero. That would mean that if the mutual information for an independent setting from this part of the equation alone would simply be zero. If we had 
perfect independence represented by the frequencies at all locations, then we would get zero here. Now, what is this term right here? This term is just the weighting based on the actual density of the joint at every single location. In other words, when we're calculating mutual information, I want to weight each one of these cells based on how much frequency or how, what proportion of the probability is included within each one of the cell so that this overall measure of mutual information is probability weighted. Okay, that's it. That's mutual information. That's actually a super cool methodology. And it's just one line of code within Python to make this calculation. So if we run that mutual information calculation on our data set, this is what we get. And this is fascinating. Well, I've normalized each one of the measures to have a maximum of one. So porosity or the highest one will have one. And then they'll just go down from there. What do we see? Vitronite reflectance is looking like it is effectively independent with our response feature. That's interesting. Acoustic impedance, brittleness also don't look to have very good relationships at all. Now that's that's fascinating. This is very powerful. TOC permeability and porosity have much stronger relationships. Okay, now let's look at some model-based methods. We've done some statistics-based methods, visualization-based methods. We've done some statistics that are model-free, like mutual information and the conditional statistics. Now let's get model-based. The simplest way to do it is we do a linear regression model. It's a multi-linear regression model. We're basically fitting a model with coefficients applied to each one of the predictor features plus a constant and intercept, a bias term we may call it, to predict the, in this case, our response feature being production. And so if we do that, we could actually look at the coefficients and see what they're telling us. Now, we got to be concerned here because this is sensitive to the variance or dispersion or the magnitude, in fact, of each one of the properties. So or each one of the predictor features. So this may not be as strong a methodology. In fact, what people often prefer to do is called beta coefficients. With beta coefficient, you replace each one of the predictor features and the response feature with a standardized variant. In other words, we've standardized it to have a mean of zero and a variance of one. So that way, all of the features are on equal footing and we avoid any issues with regard to, you know, one feature appearing to be more important just simply because of its magnitude or level of dispersion. So this is pretty useful. We're capturing to some degree the interactions between the variables. We can go ahead and we take our rank correlation coefficient, our partial correlation coefficient from our previous round, and we'll add in the B, the B coefficients, the non-standardized multilinear regression model, and the beta coefficients where we standardize the variables. So you can see if we run that, that model-based approach, actually what's interesting is we have a very similar type of behavior with regard to what we saw with the one at a time partial correlation coefficients. We do have some significant shifts or changes. For instance, we see permeability becoming much less important when it comes to this multilinear regression model. There's another methodology we'll cover, and this will be, be one of the last ones, recursive feature elimination. This methodology works in a very interesting manner. What you do is you build a model of all the features, calculate the coefficient or feature importance. Some modeling methods actually give you a feature importance directly. Tree bagging and so forth will do that. Other methodologies like multilinear regression only give you a coefficient, and then you can use the magnitude of the coefficient to determine, to, to say, okay, this is sensitivity or importance. So we then remove the feature with the lowest coefficient or feature importance. And when we say lowest, I should have said lowest absolute magnitude, right? Um, closest to zero, right? So lowest absolute feature. And then we rebuild the model. After we rebuild the model, then we repeat the process. So it's like a championship. It's a playoff. The weakest is eliminated. You rebuild the model. Boom, boom, boom. And if you do that, what you can then do is the last one standing is the most important feature. The first one eliminated is the least important. And you have now have a rank order of your features. If you do that, you'll actually find from recursive feature elimination using linear regression models, TOC, vitronite reflectance, acoustic impedance, porosity, permeability, and then brittleness. There's quite a bit of a change here. 
And so we may be concerned with perhaps the model we chose was not flexible enough. So for fun, and we'll talk about this later, don't worry, I'm jumping ahead, I replaced recursive feature elimination with a random forest. Now that's super cool. You can do any type of model-based approach. And of course, random forest, as we'll cover later, is quite more, quite a bit more flexible than a multilinear regression model. And when we do that, we get an ordering of features that's more, more similar to what we've been seeing so far. <clears throat> so this is more consistent what we've done before. Now, the advantages of recursive fe feature elimination method, the actual model can be used to assess feature ranks. What if I'm using random forest at the end to make predictions and I'm trying to pick the right features to use in random forest? That's, that's a nice level of consistency. I can check using the exact type of modeling I'm going to model with. The ranking is based on the contribution of each one of the features to the model. So this is pretty cool. The, the neat thing about it is the code in Python is a simple wrapper available right in scikit-learn and you can plug and play any one of the scikit-learn machine learning methodologies in. And so I was able to repeat this with random forest by making just one quick modification to the code. Okay, so that's it. That's my description of this whole entire area of feature ranking. I hope, I hope you can see that I provided a bunch of kind of rules of thumb, some heuristics, some thoughts about how you compare and contrast each one of these ranking metrics. Mixed into this is always going to be a knowledge expert knowledge about the underlying setting and good data visualization to look at the data and make sure we understand what's going on. All right. I hope this was helpful to you. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. It's my pleasure to share all of my lectures online and I hope they're useful to people. I like to hear back from people. If you have questions, please contact me. I'm the Geostats guy on YouTube with Geostats guy lectures. Geostats guy on what else? Twitter and GitHub. I post all of the worked out examples. They're all available on my GitHub repositories and the data sets I use are also all available for anyone who wants to try them out. All right. I hope this was um, interesting to you. We'll keep carrying on with feature transformations in our next lecture. All right. Take care, y'all.